All right. We are live. Welcome to Pure Dog Talks Live at Five. I am your host, Laura Reeves, and I am so excited to have you guys all join us. So while everybody's hopping on, I've got a couple super, super cool announcements. Uh, in case you haven't heard, like, I don't know how you couldn't, but in case you haven't, last month we launched a new exclusive perk for our patrons. Pure Pep Talk is a weekly text message with an upbeat, fun, educational tidbit. And you can sign up for the patrons group and the Pep Talk messages for as little as $5 a month. Okay, now currently Natalie's yelling at me for telling you that, but I'm saying, I mean, that's less than a, I don't know, frappa hooey at your favorite coffee stand, right? For a whole month. And you get a lot of other stuff that goes with that patrons access. We've streamlined a lot of the offerings for the patrons, made a new patrons group, and we've grown our existing all access patrons group to a community network of judges, breeders, experts, exhibitors, all with the same goal. Your passion is our purpose. Next up, if you haven't had a chance to check out the ebook, audiobook download offering, How to Stack Your Dog is part of it, the link in the chat will take you there. A great option to share with your puppy buyers, your friends that are looking for a well bred, pure, purebred dog, etc. And, oh, yeah, yeah, PPS, swag. New items just released on the swag store. Link in the comments so you can wow your friends at your next event. So, summer's over. We're moving on. We're in October. It's Love the Breeds Month here at Pure Dog Talk. And today we're sharing some of our favorite breeds. Listeners submitted their suggestions on the Facebook page. And the choices uh, from the audience requests were drum roll please, <laughs> American Hairless Terriers, Berger Blanc Suisse, White, she White Shepherds, Ibethan Hounds, Miniature Pinchers, and Tibetan Terriers. So, quick question, pop quiz, do you know what, quote, the dog should stand well down on its pads means exactly? and which breed it might apply to. Okay, let's get started. All right, we have first the American Hairless Terrier. Emily Rose Cunningham submitted the American Hairless Terrier. Fun fact that Emily provided, American Hairless Terriers are the only recessive hairless dog breed, but they also come in a coated variety. I've actually seen both, so FYI. The American Hairless Terrier is, according to the breed standard, a small to medium-sized, smoothly muscled, and active terrier. Ancestors of the breed were bred to hunt rats and other vermin. The lack of coat on the hairless variety of the American Hairless Terrier renders them unsuited for most hunting activities. Yeah. They have, however, retained a strong hunting instinct and excel in many other activities and sports. The breed is energetic, alert, curious, and intelligent. Given early socialization and training, they excel as companions, displaying great affection for their owners and family. American hairless terriers should not be sparred during confirmation judging. Okay, you guys, so this is a small breed you're maybe familiar with Chinese Cresteds that come in a hairless variety that has a mane. You might be familiar with the Sholo Exquintly uh, that comes in three different size varieties. We've had Sholos on the podcast previously. But the American Hairless Terrier, ideal height, 12 to 16 inches. Small dog, right? Uh, it's medium bone, not heavy or coarse. It, the expression is alert, curious, and intelligent. 
they come in a variety of colors and as mentioned in the introduction they also come in a coded variety their disqualifications are hanging ears a bobtail or docked tail on the hairless variety and in the coated variety a wire broken or long coat also merle and albino are disqualifications so having worked with someone who showed american hairless terriers i've had my literally hands on them uh, the skin is very soft very warm to the touch they are sort of that uh, um, heating pad of dogs in the hairless variety according to the standard the hairless puppies are born with a soft vestigial down known as the birth coat and this generally covers the body but diminishes over time and puppies should be completely hairless by approximately eight to ten weeks of age a mature hairless dog should be free of hair with the exception of whiskers and guard hairs on the eyebrows and muzzle so there you go very very cool information about a breed that many people don't know very much about the american hairless terrier next up is the berger blanc suisse and we will have a photo of that available hopefully shortly there we go so according to our people who actually submitted these um, breeds this was submitted by eli sandberg and the berger blanc suisse is an fci breed white swiss shepherd in the united kennel club ukc here in the states it's uh, known as the white shepherd the fun fact that eli submitted the white Swiss Shepherd originates from the German Shepherd dog. For almost a century, there was little discerning between the German Shepherd and the white Shepherd. Then, in the 1930s, the white colored dog was removed from the Shepherd breeding and almost became extinct. By the 1960s, the white Shepherd had made a comeback, and in the US and Canada, it was distinguished as a separate breed. In the early 1970s, some of these dogs were sent to Switzerland where they prospered and multiplied the new white swiss shepherd breed was added to the swiss book in 1991 and in 217 uh, 2017 the kennel club of the united kingdom officially recognized the breed as well so now if we go to the fci standard for the breed it tells us that in the USA and Canada, the white shepherd dogs have gradually become to be accepted as a distinct breed. This is the FCI standard, you guys. There's no AKC standard currently for the breed. <clears throat> the first dogs of this breed were imported to Switzerland in the early 70s. The American male Lobo, whelped on 5th of March 1966, can be considered as the progenitor of the breed in Switzerland. The descendants of this male registered with the Swiss stud book and other white shepherd dogs imported from the USA and Canada gradually multiplied. There now exists a big number of purebred over several generations. Uh, these dogs have been registered as a new breed in the appendix of the Swiss stud book since June of 1991. Their general appearance is described as a powerful, well-muscled, medium-sized, white shepherd dog with erect ears double coat which is either of medium length or long elongated shape medium sized bone and elegant harmonious outline it's a rectangular breed that is lively and balanced enjoys action attentive with good ability to be trained they are friendly and discreet high social competence and devoted to his owner i like high social competence that's a great phrase never afraid or aggressive without provocation joyful and easy to teach uh, capability has capability for all around education so that is the berger blank suisse also described as I'm trying to get to a size you guys give me a give me half a second here we go oh it's in centimeters I don't know 58 to 60 
56 centimeters for males, 53 to 61 centimeters for females. Somebody out there that does metrics, help me out. Um, and they are disqualified for being aggressive or overly shy, having high anxiety, or having blue eyes. So they should also have dark pigment on their nose and eye rims. So very, very interesting breed. Um, let's see if I've got somebody in the chat that's going to tell me. Barge. 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 Is, you're saying Barge, Cindy, rather than Berge? Okay. Barge, Long Suisse. Thank you, Cindy. Our next breed up is going to be, I believe, the Ibethan Hound. Is that our next breed up? I think it is. Um, this, the Ibethan Hound was submitted for consideration by Mackenzie Ferguson. And for a fun fact, she added that they aren't true sighthounds. And if you guys listen to the podcast with my friend, uh, Whippet breeder, Bo Bingston, you'll remember he agrees with that. <laughs> and this um, okay, so 65 centimeters is 25 inches for people wondering about the size of the Barge Blanc Suisse. I've been corrected on my pronunciation. Thank you all. Um, yeah, I thought it was Berge. Okay, Berge. Very good. So moving on. Ibethan Hound. This dog right here is my own personal dog. This was Keeper when they said they wanted to feature Ibethan Hounds, I absolutely jumped at the opportunity. Um, Ibethan Hounds come in two coat varieties. This is the wire coated variety. So in addition, that's an additional fun fact. Many people are used to seeing only the smooth coated Ibethan Hound. This is a wire coated Ibethan Hound. The Ibethan Hound uh, was developed on the Iberian Peninsula in Spain. They are a rabbit hunting dog um, from the standard it says they're a hunting dog whose quarry is primarily rabbits this ancient hound was bred for thousands of years with function being of prime importance lithe and racy the ibethan possesses a deer-like elegance combined with the power of a hunter strong without appearing heavily muscled the ibethan hound is a hound of uh, moderation with the exception of the ears, he should not appear extreme or exaggerated. In the field, the Ibethan Hound is as fast as top coursing breeds and without equal in agility, high jumping and broad jumping ability. He is able to spring to great heights from a standstill. And trust me when I tell you, this is entirely true. That dog keeper could clear a 48 inch X pen from a standing position. Just boing. They also have a fabulously unique hunting style. They sproing into the air and you can see their little ears working when they're hunting. Their ears are how they're hunting, not so much with their nose. They're hearing the game in the grasses or their cover. And then when their ears work like little radar, they jump in the air and they pounce and that flushes the game. It is the uh, Absolutely coolest thing to watch. Um, there are videos out there that are available to watch them do it. Having watched it myself live um, in my own back paddock, I'm telling you, there is not much cooler than watching an Ibethan hound hunt. Um, they the deer-like quality is very specific, as is the movement. They talk about Okay, from the standard, an efficient, light, and graceful single tracking movement, a suspended trot with joint flexion when viewed from the side. The Ibethan Hound exhibits smooth reach in the front, balanced drive, giving the appearance of skimming over the ground. And this is absolutely 100% accurate. When you see a really good moving Ibethan Hound, they just look like they're not touching the ground. And when it talks about joint flexion, 
It's very important from the um, judge's education perspective. They, they talk about this. The joint flexion in an Ibethan hound is not hackney, should never be hack, hackney. It's just simply that there is some motion at the pastern when the dog is moving. The only disqualification is any color other than white or red and any pigment color which is not as described. Um, and so in the standard, it describes the red and white dogs. There are multiple options for markings. And as I mentioned, two coat varieties. When it talks about the coat, um, it's very specific that they should be untrimmed. Short coated dogs are shortest on the head and ears and longest at the back of the thighs. Wire haired, and this is this is kind of weird to see if you're unfamiliar with it. Wire haired Ibethan hounds can be from one to three inches in length on all or part of the body, with possibly a mustache. Both types of coats are hard in texture. Neither coat is preferable to the other, unless you're me and I can have a wire coated sight hound, in which case, duh. Um, they are absolutely, absolutely a phenomenal breed for anyone who is interested. I, I just could talk about them forever. I just love them. The first time I ever showed an Ibethan hound was a smooth bitch in Canada. And I didn't know anything about the breed and I was covering it for a friend of mine. And the breeder says, here, here's the dog. And all you need to know is that 90% of the judging is on their ears. And so I managed to get ears from this dog and won a 500 dog gaze specialty. Um, the first time I'd ever touched her leash, it was a little crazy. The ears are, this is again, very important for the breed. The ears are large, pointed, and natural. This is not a, a, a cropped breed, docked breed, any of that. On alert, the ears should never droop, bend, or crease. The ears are more wide open than just a tall triangle. The inner edge of each ear is not a straight line, but has an obtuse angle or curve between the base and tip, which gives the ear a slight inside corner. The overall shape resembles an elongated geometric rhomboid with its bottom third cut off. Highly mobile, the ear can point forward, sideways, or be folded backward according to the mood. Ears that do not show the ability to be erect are a serious fault. Um, so when I say that ears are so much a hallmark of the breed, they absolutely are. Um, so yeah, so that is our story about Ibethan hounds. Keep in mind, if you guys... <laughs> If you guys have additional breeds that you would like to hear about, you can drop them in the comments. So far, we've discussed the American Hairless Terrier, the Berger, Berger Blanc Suisse, and the Ibethan Hound. So next up is the Miniature Pincher. The Miniature Pincher was a suggestion from Isabel on Facebook. And her fun fact is that they are the king of toys and that they're happy when they're treated like a big dog. And the photo you see on your screen is from a very um, dear friend of mine um, who has had some very successful men pins. And the sort of hallmark of the breed of the miniature pincher is that hackney movement. And that's shown very nicely in that photo. So according to the standard, the miniature pincher is structurally balanced, sturdy, compact, short coupled, smooth coated dog, naturally proud, vigorous, and alert. Char characteristic traits are his hackney like action, fearless animation, complete self possession, and spirited presence. Um, they are a, a lovely toy breed, 10 to 12 and a half inches in height. Qualification under 10 inches or over 12 and a half inches. So they're a good little breed. Uh, the ears are set high, standing erect from base to tip, maybe cropped or uncropped. They are a docked breed. In the standard, tail, it says the tail is set high, held erect, docked in proportion to the size of the dog. 
Let's go to movement because this is so much a characteristic. The forelegs and hind legs move parallel with feet turning neither in nor out. The hackney-like action is a high-stepping, reaching, free and easy gait in which the front leg moves straight forward and in front of the body and the foot bends at the wrist. The dog drives smoothly and strongly from the rear. The head and tail are carried high. The temperament is described as fearless animation, complete self-possession, possession, and spirited presence. The two colors are red and black and tan. Let me just verify that. Solid clear red, stag red, black with sharply defined rust red markings on cheeks. Uh, chocolate, there we go. Chocolate with rust red markings. Um, disqualifications, any color other than listed. Thumb mark, patch of black hair surrounded by rust on the front of the forelegs between the foot and the wrist. On chocolates, the patch is chocolate hair. White on any part of the dog, which exceeds one half inch in its longest dimensions. So they are, if you think about the Doberman Pinscher, the German Pinscher, the mini miniature Pinscher, they're all in that general family of dogs. Uh, men pens being obviously the smallest, um, pocket sized. Um, Wendy, I have a whole podcast on Lancaster healers, uh, actually Lancashire healers. And if um, Natalie is a really sweet and wonderful human, she will go to the to the website and keyword search Lancashire, L-A-N-C-A-S-H-I-R-E healers. And there is a, a fabulous podcast with one of the breeders here in the U.S. So we're working on that for you, Wendy. Um, Min pens, um, fun, fabulous little dogs, the ones I've been around. The good ones are fabulous. The, the ones that you see that are not as strong or confident as described in the standard you know, they're, they're little dogs, so they, they can, they can cause a lot of fuss in order to uh, dissuade you from, you know, being mean to them like that, right? Like they just, they just, they'll use their voices if they can't use their size to intimidate you. Um, I love watching a good one of this breed move. They really will remind you of a fabulous hackney pony. Um, the good ones. So, um, okay. Next up is Tibetan Terriers. And I've now got poor Natalie doing double duty. And can I just simply tell you how impossible it would be for me to do this live podcast for you guys successfully without Natalie in the background. So didn't do what was the, the Dave Letterman show, the guy in the background, that's Natalie. All right, Tibetan Terriers were my pick to add to the to the mix. We had um, requests for breeds that had already been covered. I've already done um, Tibetan Spaniels, which was one of the breeds that was suggested. And I put that link in the Facebook post. I have also done um, an interview on Las Atzos that fall into the same sort of Tibetan breed breed category. I have a fabulous series on Tibetan Mastiffs. So I've done a lot of the Tibetan breeds, but we hadn't done Tibetan Terriers. So I said, let's pull that up. So I went, it, it's a breed I showed a couple of. I'm not a, a specialist in this breed by any stretch, but they're a fascinating breed to me. And remember we talked about at the very beginning, the, the piece of the standard that says um, what does it mean um, if the, okay, if I can get the word right here. Let's see. The dog should stand well down on its pads. That line is from the Tibetan Terrier standard. And the way the standard describes it is that that foot shape, um, which is described as large and round and, let's see, large and round and flat. Yes. The feet are large, flat, and round in shape, producing a snowshoe effect that provides traction. The pads are thick and strong. So when you examine a Tibetan Terrier, the judge is supposed to feel the toe 
toes of the dog. And they're not really supposed to be arch like you think of most dog's feet. They are supposed to be flat. They are not supposed to be splayed out. The toes are still tight. It's just that the pads are flat. And that's what it means when it says the dog should stand well down on its pads. And from the opening paragraph of the standard, it says that the Tibetan Terrier evolved over many centuries, surviving in Tibet's extreme climate and difficult terrain. The breed developed a protective double coat, compact size, unique foot construction, and great agility. The Tibetan Terrier served as a steadfast, devoted companion in all of its owner's endeavors. And so I just thought this was a fascinating breed to talk about, to look at. And I pulled up some information from the Tibetan Terrier Club of America website that I thought was just really lyrical and um, thought I would share with you because I thought it was a lot of fun. So just as wind is from the Tibetan Terrier Club of America website from an article written by one of their breeders, just as wind and water can sculpt a distinct topography, I believe topography can also change a particular psyche. Geography is entwined with its regional artists, musicians, and writers. Georgia O'Keeffe's paintings of the Southwest, Aaron Copeland's evocative music of the vast American landscape, and Wallace Schregner's novels steeped with the mind and place of the 20th century America are examples of how place can shape an individual psyche and express itself. If one seeks to understand the rugged, versatile, charismatic Tibetan terrier, it is helpful to know more about where they evolved. The country of Tibet embodied and expressed in the personality, demeanor, and physique of the TT. Having lived for thousands of years in geography full of extremes is no incidental matter when forensically considering how this unique landscape impact the psyche of the TT. Might an environment that had wide altitude variations, harsh temperatures, and precipitation extremes have favored a dog with an adaptable, highly nuanced personality? Historically used as caravan dogs, Guards for livestock and monasteries and traveling companions, TTs are well suited for the multitasking demands of contemporary life. Called little people in Tibet, they are learning clear dogs, deeply bonded to their families and often possessing an array of contradictory behaviors. Are they active? Well, yes and no. Do they like people? Well, yes and no. Are they easy to train? Yes, but not in any way you would imagine. <laughs> are they highly sensitive? Yes, but they also are very tenacious. Are they hardy? Yes, they're ex an extremely robust breed, but a pine needle cut between the back legs on a walk can be a man-down event. <laughs> they are drama-prone, but also stoic. They absolutely love snow, but abhor rain. They will push the boundaries with their ordinary mischievous antics, but sincerely want to do the right thing. This may be why many creative people make an excellent match for a TT companion, as they inherently sympathize with an out-of-the-box soul. I just thought that sounded so... I, I, it was absolutely accurate for the ones that I showed, and it was such a lyrical and beautiful description of a breed tying it to its region and to its people. And it just, it just took me back so much to what we talk about at Pure Dog Talk, that purebred dogs are history and they are art and they represent a place in time. And, and that article just really captured all of that for me as regards the Tibetan Terrier. Dr. Seuss feet. Yes, absolutely. Um, and no, not actually a terrier. Um, many of the Tibetan breeds kind of get mischaracterized, but this is the Tibetan terrier. The Tibetan spaniel is a smaller, more compact, um, closer in um, appearance to sort of um, a short-coated Pekingese or, or closer to that concept. At any rate, the 
Tibetan Terrier has a lot more, more leg under it, as it were. So there you go. All right. So we've got the Lancashire healers up. Natalie is absolutely amazing. So in our fun facts, Tibetan Terriers, not really Terriers, and have Dr. Seuss feet. Um, all right. Who else has got more for me? Send me questions. Send me comments. Drop them in the chat. Uh, meanwhile, I will go back and we can pick out some more cool, fun facts about the breeds that we already have. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure we got all of those in in the time we had allotted. Talking about the American Hairless Terrier, we're back to this particular concept. I think that the description of the coat in the hairless and the coated variety is really interesting. Um, so in the American Hairless Terrier, it says under the coat section, the breed is hairless but has a coated counterpart. The coated dog is covered with a short, smooth, dense coat that has a sheen. Whiskers are not removed. A coated dog that lacks a full coat is to be seriously faulted. In the hairless variety, hair, we talked about the hairless puppies with their down that they come with at birth. Um, and then in the guard hairs, talks about the guard hairs on the eye, eyebrows and muzzles. We talked about that. Short, fine, vellus, it says, hair may be present on the body of a mature dog. Uh, the skin is smooth and warm to the touch. Disqualification in the coated variety wire broke no long coat. Okay. So there is an interesting um, history of this breed. And I'm going to see if I can pull up the breed standard so I get it right. But my understanding is there is a direct connection to the rat terrier. Um, and so I want to let's see if Emily is on here and she can get to it before I do, but I'm going to try and get to the, to the national club site and see if we can get to the history here. You guys know that this is one of the best ways to learn about your breeds is trying to get to the actual national club website and see the pictures and see about all of the history and all of the information that goes with the breed. All right. And of course, it doesn't give me what I was looking for. Okay. Here we go. American hairless terrier originated in the South of the U S. So it's a native sun breed to the U S as a natural variation. That's what I thought. Okay. I wasn't wrong as a natural variation of the rat terrier. This completely hairless dog is a lively, intelligent, and friendly companion that is often the perfect answer for those with allergies. The breeding of the American Hairless Terriers began in earnest in the early 1970s when a hairless puppy was born into a litter of mid-sized rat terriers. This was not the first hairless puppy born to these parents, but it was the first to be given to a couple in Louisiana, Edwin and Willie Scott, who immediately fell in love with this female puppy and named her Josephine. Josephine became the foundation for the American hairless terrier breed. The AHT is well known for its propensity for fewer allergic reactions than other breeds, allowing them into homes once denied. This combined with their intelligence and ease of care, make them perfect companions while maintaining the drive to excel in performance events. 12 to 16 inches tall at the shoulders. So we said, that and here um we talked about the hairless and the coated variety um the coated oh this is a great little tidbit the coated variety is lovingly called the coated carrier by the aht fanciers although it is fully coated it carries the hairless gene a coated dog that lacks a full coat is to be uh, seriously faulted so there you go how cool is that i knew I knew that I knew something about hairless terriers. Okay, so Eli, we showed a picture of your dog and your breed. If you drop it in the chat, you can share some more interesting factoids that you would like to have us 
share on with the rest of the group. Um, I think it's really interesting that this particular shepherd breed calls for the back to be level and firm. There, we don't see any of the um, special three-point stand that we see with the German Shepherd dog or any of that particular thing. Um, tail is a bushy saber. Uh, so very much similar to a lot of the sh uh, shepherds in that basic concept. Uh, just running through the breed standard for anything else. Rhythmical sequences of steps with even drive and enduring. Front legs reaching out far with strong thrust. Trot is ground covering and easy. This is the gate section from the FCI standard. So here's another one I think is interesting when we offer two different coat varieties. So there's another one with that. The um, white shepherd medium length coat. Dense, close lying, double coat, abundant undercoat covered with hard, straight, protective hair, face, ears, and front of legs covered with shorter hair, neck and the back of the legs, the coat is slightly longer, slightly wavy, hard hair is permitted. In the long coat version, which I believe is the photo that we have, it is a dense, close-lying double coat, abundant upper undercoat covered with hard, straight, protective hair, uh, shorter hair on the face and the legs, neck, long coat forms a distinct mane, and the back of the legs, it forms trousers, and the hair on the tail is bushy. The coat length should never be exaggerated. Slightly wavy, hard hair is permitted, and pure white is the only cover. Um, and Eli says it's a very diverse breed. Many of them excel in performance of events. Um, okay, so so Cindy, you're saying similar to the German Shepherd dog, but based on the photo, without some of the exaggerations that we see in some of the U.S. dogs, or, or talk to us about that. Eli or Cindy, somebody drop in the comments. Um, so this particular dog that we're showing in the photo here, Berger Blanc Suisse, I think that's actually a S-U-I-S-S-E, spelling error, my bad, our bad. Um, it's a very pretty dog. You can see the front construction balancing the rear, so that's nice. Uh, let's see, Eli says that during the last UKC Premier Nationals, we had the largest entry at the show. Oh, very cool. Um, so what did that, how many dogs was that, Eli? Um, That's a very cool. Uh, are you, Eli, can you tell us, are you working on AKC uh, recognition for this breed? Right. It, it started out as a part of the German Shepherd breed, but has, from what I understood from the standard, diverged over time. Um, Eli, can you... Can you tell us, are you working on recognition for the breed within the American Kennel Club, or you're still a ways away from that? Okay, so while I'm waiting on Eli's answer in my chat, um, I thought we would go down uh, 50 dogs. Oh my gosh, that's a huge entry. That's amazing. Good job, Eli. Um, and I hope I'm saying your name right. If I'm not, just yell at me. Um, back to the Ibethan hounds. Um, I think one of the things that's interesting about this particular breed, they are more of a, what we would think of as a Padenko, not a, not a sight hound, but we, we look at this breed and it has very, very moderate angulation, very open angles. And it talks about in the breed standard and you see it absolutely in the dogs in the ring, the shoulders are elastic, never loose with moderate breadth at the withers. The shoulder blades are well laid back. At the point of the shoulder, they join to a rather upright upper arm. The elbow is positioned in front of the deepest part of the chest. It is well held in, but not so close as to restrict movement. The forearms are long and straight, bone is clean and fine. One of the most fascinating things that I learned about this breed as I owned them over the course of time 
is that their construction, when it talks about the, the elbow is in front of the deepest part of the chest, this is because when they hunt, they literally change direction midair and their legs cross underneath their body. And so that is what gives them ability to be as agile as they are when they're hunting. Okay. Thanks, Eli. Thanks for updating us on your breed and that it is an ongoing process for the Berger Blanc Suisse uh, to accomplish AKC recognition. I understand it is a lot to do from everything that I have been given to understand. So, so there's the Ibethan hound, some of the uniqueness of that, the ears, the, the front, the chest is above the elbows at where the elbows meet the body. Um, the, let's see what it exactly says, because this is, is positioned from the so the the chest actually may go below the elbow or to the elbow but where the elbow comes down is in front of that space the elasticity of the shoulders is another part of that ability to be super agile all right okay next up back to the min pin to cover some of these breeds a little more in depth. So when we look at the head, and I think this is really, really interesting because you have the miniature pincher, you have the Chihuahua, you have the toy Manchester Terrier, and each of them has a very specific head construction, even though they're all toy breeds short coated in the case of a smooth coat chihuahua but the heads are very distinct and should tell you exactly which breed you're looking at so the head in a min uh, miniature pincher is tapering narrow with a well-fitted but not too prominent foreface which balances the skull no indication of coarseness eyes are full slightly oval clear bright dark even to a true black. Ears are set high. Skull appears flat, tapering forward to the muzzle. Muzzle, muzzle is strong rather than fine and delicate and in proportion to the head. Uh, well balanced with only a slight drop to the muzzle, which is parallel to the top of the skull. Lips and cheeks small, taut, and closely adherent to each other. So there's your min pin head, right? And so when we talk about the toy Manchester Terrier, for example, we talk about the head in the in the breed standard. Why? Making my <clears throat> computer do things while I'm talking is not always all that easy. So a toy Manchester Terrier is not to exceed 12 pounds. And if you have a dog that you believe exceeds that, you weigh it. If it does exceed that, it may compete as a standard Manchester Terrier. Um, the head is described as keen and alert expression, almond shaped, nearly black eyes, moderately close together, slanting upwards on the outside. The eyes neither protrude nor sink in the skull. Correct ears for the toy variety are later at the base, tapering to a pointed tip, well up on the skull. Head is long, narrow, tight-skinned, and almost flat. Indentation of the forehead. Blunted, wet. Uh, muzzle is well filled under the eyes. Under jaws full. 
So you can see there are really distinct differences in these breed standards. And when we talk about identifying breed type, breed type is what makes it a miniature pincher and not a toy Manchester Terrier or a smooth coat Chihuahua. So it's all of those pieces taken together. So the head type on the min pen, the hackney movement, all of those things are what make it identifiably what it is. Okay. Who else has a breed? Cindy, you're here. Let's talk, talk about Berger Picard. Let's see. If you want to drop a, a picture of your breed in the comments on Facebook, I can pull up the breed standard here and we can go through it simply because you're here and that's what we get to do. Um, I love wire coated things. I told you I had to have a wire coated hound. Well, here we have the wire coated herding dog in addition to the Lacanois. It's about what we've got. When we're talking about the Berger Picard, uh, it's an ancient breed developed by the farmers and sheep herders of the Picardy region of northern France. They're medium sized, sturdily built, and well muscled. Without being bulky, they're slightly longer than tall, distinctive, erect, natural ears with a wiry coat of moderate length. They have a tail that reaches to the hawk and ends in a J hook. Very important piece of the breed sort of characteristic. Movement is free and easy, efficient and tireless to allow them to work all day, lively and alert, observant, quietly confident, aloof with strangers, but should not be timid or nervous. This is a rustic working shepherd's dog without exaggeration or refinement. All right, Cindy, give me, I've got the standard. I need a fun fact. Give me a fun fact on the Berger Picard. Besides that, I think they're really adorable. Um, let's see. There was something. Having read the standard, I have to go back and find it. That I can't. Okay. So when we talk about a wire-coated herding dog, we're talking about a dog that has a harsh, crisp coat. And it's neither flat nor curly has a slight wave. There's a soft, dense undercoat. It's pretty common when we have the, the wire-coated breeds that we're looking for that coat to be protective. The rough coat of the Picard is distinctive and should never be woolly, soft, or so profuse that it hides the outline of the dog. The ideal length of the coat is two to three inches over the entire dog. Should be a little bit shorter on the head. Um, oh yeah, this is it. The coat, I love this. The coat accents on the head and neck, which give the Picard its distinct look known as griffonage. I'm going to say that wrong and she's going to correct me, including rough eyebrows, moderate beard and mustache, and a slight ruff on the front and sides of the neck, framing the head, all of moderate length. Coat over four inches in any location should be penalized. Longer coats penalized more severely than those only slightly longer than ideal. Okay. Um, oh, yes, they were used to smuggle lace. I don't know where that came from. Mike Deedle, you win the prize. That is fabulous. Um, all right, the Canine Genome Project identifies Berger Picard as a, quote, remnant thread of an ancient land race found throughout Europe. I love the smuggling lace piece. Drevers, okay, give me a fun fact on Drevers, Jamie. We absolutely have to do Drevers. You're here, we're doing it. Um... These little guys are the coolest. Um, they are in FSS breeds uh, for the American Kennel Club. And they're in the hound group. Uh, they're small sized German hounds imported to Sweden in 1910. Oh no, wait. 
Small sized German hounds were imported to Sweden in 1910. There we go. These dogs gained a reputation as very good deer trackers, right? In 1947, the larger variety of these dogs were given the name Drever, and it was soon recognized as a Swedish breed. They are considered the first choice breed for deer tracking, but are also used for hunting hare and fox. And Jamie has told me some amazing stories about this breed and that basically the deer hunters hang out in deer camp and the dogs drive the deer to them. And I just, I think they're fabulous. Um, they can display, according to Jamie, dwarfism traits without carrying the gene. The gene is where the health concerns come from. Fascinating. Um, a Picard won the National Owner Handled Series Finals at AKC National Championship in 2020. I remember that. Um, sorry, we're and we're, of course... My Wi-Fi is actually working, which is some kind of miracle, and only because of Natalie. But Cindy says her Wi-Fi is behind. Um, so you guys just keep on keeping on. We've got 10 more minutes. If anybody has questions, another breed they would like to feature, I am all about it. I can do uh, wire hair spinoni and, and, and clumber until the cows come home. So... <laughs> Um, you guys talk to me about what else you want to know about what talk to me, talk to me, talk to me, peeps. That's okay. There's a, Oh, look at you. Oh my God. Um, Natalie, you are basically a genius. There's a photo of a driver. You guys love it. Love it. Love it. Gotta have it. Since Jamie has like, I don't know, 95% of them in the United States. I may be the only one who's ever actually seen them. Um, Okay, Ingrid, what's your theory on coats? Oh, there's a Berger Picard. Excellent. Well done. Um, I Drop your question, Ingrid. Let me hear it. Look at those cute faces on the Picards. Don't they just look like little, little elves? They're just adorable. Okay, anybody else with questions while we're waiting for Ingrid to submit her theory? Um, open coats on retrievers be a DQ. Okay, so if we're talking about Labrador retrievers, um, the standard's pretty specific about what the coat can and cannot be, um, but I don't know that it DQs an open coat. Let's look at that. Um, I do know that head coat and tail are the um, absolute hallmarks of the breed, so I expect that it's going to have something. I know that height is a DQ in that breed. Later we got here. Any deviation from the height prescribed? These are the disqualifications in a Labrador. Thoroughly pink nose, lacking in pigment. Eye rims without pigment. Docking or otherwise altering the length of the tail. Any color or a combination of colors other than black, yellow, or chocolate as described in the standard. So there is no disqualification for an open coat. The standard describes the Labrador Retriever coat as a distinctive feature of the, of the breed. Short, straight, and very dense, giving a fairly hard feeling to the hand. The Labrador should have a soft weather resistant undercoat that provides protection from the water, cold, and all types of ground cover. Slight wave down the back is permissible. Woolly coats, soft silky coats, and sparse slick coats are not typical of the breed and should be severely penalized. So in answer to your question, Ingrid, as regards open coats, it doesn't specifically say that, but those three coats that are addressed would be an indicator that that they are severely penalized. Um, and, and I don't, I don't disagree with you, but uh, Ingrid, I think in terms of, can we talk at the Labrador Retriever Club of America into changing the standard to address open coats? Well, yeah, I wouldn't hold my breath on that, but, <laughs> um, but you're absolutely right. And it's why the correct coat is described in the standard. It's such a hallmark of the breed. And if it doesn't have that and it goes into the icy water off of the coast of Labrador, 
it's going to freeze to death. So you know what I'm saying. Um, white shepherds are also very well represented in UKC total dog events. I love that. I think that's a very, very cool. Um, I think that Ingrid talking about height DQ versus coat DQ, um, uh, you know, when we think about a Labrador retriever, we're thinking about a dog that can get in and out of the boat. So I do think that a, and I, I, I don't know, maybe what they need to talk about is a weight standard, but height standard, a size standard of some shape, form or fashion for the breed makes sense to me. Um, having hunted over labs and gotten them in and out of boats, um, giant dogs are difficult. <laughs> um, but I, I think your point is very well taken. Open coats um, maybe should be something to be, you know, considered. Certainly when we are educated on the breed, we look very carefully at the correct coat rather than so much the faulty coat, but the correct coat and what that should look like. Oh, oh, wow, cool, Natalie. Natalie and uh, Stacy and a whole bunch of people went to... Um, Let's see who else was there. There was uh, Barb Perel went and Jenna went. Uh, there was an IABCA show in Idaho, and she said there were four white shepherds there, which was very, very cool. All right, you guys. Um, I I have a secret uh, for next month. I, I can't tell you what it is exactly just yet because it's still in the works, but there's a secret surprise that we will give you a tease on coming up in the next few weeks. Our next live at five will be November 1st. Talk about kicking off the holiday season in style. Um, yes, I think we all here can love the IABCA shows. They are such fun. Um, oh, I should have done Basse Fauve de Bretagne. That would have been good, but we're out of time. So thank you all for joining us. Super, super glad that you could all get here tonight for our live at five. Um, always remember that you can check out the podcast on the website, puredogtalk.com. And you can also find all of our archived information, the link to the patrons group to join and sign up for the pep talk, the book, all those things available at puredogtalk.com. Thank you all for joining us. And always, always, always remember, we couldn't do it without you. And our, purpo our purpose is your passion. Thanks very much. Good night, everybody.